Welcome to Comedy Nerd, Eddie. Thank you. Nice to have you here. We're at Just Thank for Laughs, Just Pour Rire, yes. and Zoo Fest in the Mixie Bus. Uh, yeah. And you, are you, would you say you finished your festival or do you have a few more shows to go? No, I'm done. You're done? Yeah, I'm done. done. I'm done. Uh, amazing year for you. I, I know you just hosted yeah. the gala and I wanted to start by talking to you about that because okay. I'm sure that's been in the works. I want to hear about how you even got the gala and then what the whole process was like for you. Man, the stars were, they were all aligned for me to get that gala. Mm. It's mainly because of Big Brother Celebrity. Mm. But um, uh, but the, for the backstory, uh, I, I was I hosted the gala with uh, Richard Sanzifia, right? And the first year they had called, they they called me for uh, to do Big Brother, and I couldn't do it because my my grandma was uh, passing away, and the day I said no, the the next day she passed away, so I couldn't make it because we had to to do the funerals uh, back home in Congo. So we had to like you know prepare the funeral travel arrangement and everything. So I, I couldn't let my my mom and my sister deal with all that alone, you know. So that's why I refused to do Big Brother on the on the first um, on the for the first season. Then they called Rich, and Richardson said yes, he did it. Then the second season they called me. Richardson coached me to be able to do it. Then while I was in the house, they uh, they called me. Uh, to offer me to host a gala with him. Oh, you're kidding. So it was while you were on the yeah, show exactly, that you found out you were hosting the exactly. show. Exactly. Wow. And it was such a relief on my shoulder because I was like, okay, if they're asking me this because things are going very well. And to me, I was like, uh, yeah, I, everything I was aiming for, I, I surpassed it, you know? Well, you guys did a great job. And what I was Thank curious you. about too is you, you work solo. You're a stand up comedian. Yeah. Richardson's a stand up comedian. How yeah. did you approach doing a duo? gala uh what was your preparation for it and what was like the whole writing process of that because a lot of people who are listening to uh or watching this a, a lot of i think english comedians listen to this show and mm -hmm. people who know about our, the english comedy scene you work mostly in french mostly or exclusively in french, yeah. in french. what not, is not the process but mostly in french well yeah. what, what's the process for hosting a gala like did you have a team that was helping you that was coaching we, you was we, there a vision we had a we had we had a team at first it was me on the writing process, it was me, Richardson, and Audrey Rousseau, who is a writer, right? She we, she does what we call in French script edition, meaning that making sure that all your your jokes and make sense, you know, and getting rid of the fat, every, getting rid of everything that doesn't make sense or doesn't belong in uh, in your uh, in your jokes, right? And we were uh, three, and the way we worked. Uh, like, I didn't want to do much stand-up because uh, Richardson Zephyr, he's a champion in uh, in improv. He's an improv champion. That's the way a lot of people don't know about it, but he's an improv champion. So doing characters and stuff like that, he's really good at it. And it's something is really out of my comfort zone. I've never really done things like that before, right? Not not not, not at that scale, right? But I really wanted to tap into it. Like I'm saying, I'm... I'm, just, I'm I felt like if I was gonna go and do a gala, I might as well go out of my comfort zone and just go and try to do something very different. You know, propose something that people are not used to see me uh, doing usually. So it was really cool. He got into it. So we wrote a couple of sketches, uh, and uh, yeah, we you know like we we like brainstorm ideas, and then one of us would go and you know uh, write a first draft. And then we would come back and punch it up, and then that's how we all started. And were there moments of, of challenge in that because you're working with another person instead of like the control you have when you're on stage just solo? No, no, because those two people is people I've really used to work uh, work with. First of all, me and Richardson, we work on uh, the Bye Bye 2020, which is the Bye Bye. Which for those who don't don't know, the Bye Bye is the the most watched TV program in Quebec. And it's a, it's a one show that uh, plays on the uh, December 31st. And it's with the countdown, uh, like the countdown for the new year. And it's a sketch show, which is the most uh, viewed show on TV, right? Uh, and uh, the Bye Bye 2020 is the one that broke all the records. And me and Rich, we wrote on it and we won uh, uh, a Gémeaux 
Oh, a Gemini okay, I did not for, know that. Okay, yeah, cool. Yeah, for that. Me, it was me, Rich, uh, Dolino, Bruno, uh, Bruno Lee, uh, Oh, Preach. Gariana was on Gariana, that too, right? Gariana, yeah. Oh, we okay, all, so that kind Frédéric of inspired uh, them exactly. thinking of you, the two of you as hosts for this gala. No, no, no it, it didn't really inspire. It's just to say that me and Rich, we have worked together before, mm. right? And Audrey Rousseau also helped me work on my previous show, my previous solo show. So it's two people that I already had confidence uh, that I already trusted, sorry. Okay. That I already trusted when I um, when it comes to writing, mm. right? So it was super easy to work with them. Mm. And I know you work, you started in English. Uh, and like just going, I want to just kind of delve okay. a little bit back into your history because I know, first of all, that you were a rap artist, that you won yeah. some awards, and then you switched into stand up. So yeah, what inspired exactly. your switch of getting um, into stand up comedy? Okay, so what inspired my switch is that. Um, just because when I was rapping and I was just uh, going on stage, I never liked just going and just start rapping without like putting, uh, putting my songs in context. Like me and my group, we, we never liked that, and we always wanted to uh, involve the crowd in what we were doing. Mm. And and uh, the one way to do it is to talk, to do some crowd work, you know. And at the time, I didn't know what crowd work was, but that's what I was doing naturally. Right, and I was trying to be funny and stuff like that, and that's what inspired me because a lot of people, hey, you should try stand up. I think you should be good at it, at it, and that's where uh, I was like, okay, I mean, let me look into it, and then I fell in love with stand up because stand up and rap are not very different from one another. It was basically you just like have you have one mic in your hand and you throwing punchlines. <laughs> you know what I mean? Oh, you see rap that way as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's what it is. Yeah. You're just throwing punchlines. You know what I mean? It's just a maybe different I don't system. feel like I've laughed a lot from much <laughs> rap, but maybe was your rap a little well, bit if funny? You think, if you think about like uh, rappers like Eminem or oh, that's true. Or rappers yeah, like yeah. Buster Rhymes, Humpty Dan pretty... not that was it Humpty Dance or that that yeah the oh, yeah, Square the, Dance, the, the, also square the Humpty dance. Hump and yeah, stuff yeah, like that. Yeah, yeah, all those There's are funny. Yeah, yeah. Rappers, oh, that's you know true. That's true. Exactly. So basically, a punchline is not really designed to make you laugh only. You also designed to have it's basically designed to have a reaction from the crowd mm. so it could be like oh even when a, a politician is uh making a speech sometimes it's punched up by comedians mm. because you need to throw a punchline to have a reaction from the crowd so that's those are all the same system of having a premise and a punch you know and well, I, mean? I think the way you approach your comedy it's clearly influenced by your your need to rap and your need to even what you're saying I don't, I don't know if every comedian looks at it that way as just getting a reaction because even like I was listening to one of your jokes about mm -hmm. a terrorist and you talked about the Koran. You're like, if he was reading the Koran, he wouldn't be, he wouldn't be doing these terrible things. I know, you know it was me. Yeah, you did. You said something yeah. about, yeah, it was, it was, it was, was one it? of your first shows that you did in two, you, what, what you oh, were doing was talking one, about a, a bomber. Okay. A bomber. And if the bomber had read the Koran, maybe he wouldn't be doing this, these uh, terrible acts. And yeah. then the audience, they clapped. And you got, you know, an applause break. That's but I was, crazy. That, I, that must be a long it was, time it ago. It was edgy. But, but, a long but, but, time ago. Yeah. Eddie, even like three weeks ago, you were at Le Baudel <laughs> doing your, your gala. You talked about Russia. Like yeah, most Ukraine people don't Russia. even go yeah, into that. You're like, well, let's yeah, talk about yeah. Russia and what's going on right now. Because you go to, I've heard you described as dérangeant. You are, you are, it's funny, in English, I think deranged. Yeah. But no, that's not what it is. You're a shit disturber. Dérangeant is you... Uh, it's funny, dérangeant. Dérangeant is, is a, a shit disturbing, disturber. Disturbing, yeah, disturber, yeah. yeah, yeah. 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 I, mean, um, I don't really look at it that way, but the way I look at it when I choose a topic, I choose a topic that really, like, comes and, like, get me, like, you know, get me in my feelings. You know mm. what I mean? When I watch something and I'm like, yeah, man, this shit gets on my nerves or this shit is not fair. Mm. I don't get it. You know what I mean? Mm. And when I pick those subjects, the... The what helps me get away with it, even if the the subject is very hard to talk about or very mm -hmm. painful to talk about, is that I never share an opinion. I share my feelings. Mm. It's subtle, but it's a it's a huge difference. Because mm. when I like like when I used to do uh, um, some like radio, you know, I used to do like skits on radios and stuff like mm. that. A lot of times I used to to you know to talk about like hard subject and give my opinion. But at some point I was listening to myself and I was like, 
man, I'm giving my opinion, but nobody asked me nothing. Oh, <laughs> they don't, interesting. You know, who asked you? You know what I mean? Yeah. I was I was yeah. saying that to my own self. Like, who yeah. asked you? And I mean, then that's why I made the switch. And I was like, nah, you know, now nah, I'm, I'm going to stop talking about my opinions, saying mm. my opinion. I'm just going to talk about my feelings, how mm. I feel about the subject, which make a huge difference. Because even, even if you we disagree about the subject, if I tell you how I feel, and then I make you laugh about it on top mm. of that, then there's something going on. There's something magical going on. And that's the beauty of uh, doing stand-up comedy. Mm. Yeah. Well, I wondered too, because have there been times where you did go too far? That you, like, where, when didn't it work? Because here it is, even in... Uh, when you did Tang Tang in the Congo, yeah, okay? Yeah, that yeah. routine, it, it was very controversial in that you were saying things about race and things as a, white, a very white audience, yeah. but you you dove right into that. So even, yeah. like, how did you create that routine? But like I said, it comes from a painful thing because, like, for the people who don't know, Tang Tang is one of the... Is one of the most famous, um, uh, comic cartoon. books. Comic book is comic the books. most one of the uh, most famous comic book in the world, and in, especially in the French world, like very famous, right? So, like, millions of uh, copies, like, like it's big. And Tintin au Congo, uh, was one of the, the chapters that I had, oh. one of the copy that I had when I was a kid. And I'm Congolese. My parents are Congolese. I was born in France, but I'm, my parents are Congolese. So when I was looking at this, like, but I don't look like that. Oh, Basically, it's incredibly this, racist. This, this was blackface, like mm. blunt blackface, mm. you know what I mean? And that's why I decided to talk about it, because he was like, man, I don't look like that. This, this is not me. And I mean, they keep on selling. And there was a controversy at the time where they were trying to stop selling you make make uh make they were trying to make a uh, Moulin Sa, which is our which mm -hmm. are the mm -hmm. the editors of that the, the comic book to stop selling that copy and for it just to to be only sold to, for certain reason like you know like for either research or for uh, what we call uh, for studies and stuff oh, like okay. that but not like out loud shoot for everybody so to, where is it now uh, can they, they, still they, they still sell it they still sell it oh they can they still sell it wow you unbelievable I mean? yeah and uh, when you go to the, when you when you backtrack the story of that comic book at the time because uh, Tintin is from Belgium and uh, Congo was a Belgium colony so mm. Tintin Congo was a was an order from the the, the Belgian king mm to Hergé, which is the, 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 the writer, the creator, mm -hmm. uh, to, uh, to, to encourage uh, Belgian to go in Congo and colonize. Oh, wow. You know what I mean? Wow. And it was really horrible, mm. especially knowing that my mom and well, my parents, they grew up, they grew up during that time. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So when they, when they were born, the country was not independent. It was still not independent. And uh, there was segregation. There was a... Uh, uh, sort of like we had like a, our own version of a, a apartheid uh, mm -hmm. at the time. So basically, that's the reason that pushed me to to talk about that uh, well, comic book. Well, and people who don't know your career, uh, mm -hmm. am I? Is it right to say that that was a pivotal moment in your yeah. career? That routine yeah. got you kind of you won. Uh, uh, honor of the year in the Just for Laughs uh, that year. That, or the, that it was year, just that's, sort of that's, a breakthrough routine. Yeah, that was for my you. breakthrough for for the, the the grand public. Yeah. So can we delve back before that? Because yeah. a lot of times people say like, oh, it takes ten years to become an overnight success. So you had amazing success with that routine. Yeah. What was going on leading up to that? Like young Eddie trying to be funny in clubs. Try, mm. I know you did the comedy works a lot. Like, yeah. can you talk a little bit about what you were like as a young stand-up comedian try, when it wasn't working, when you weren't even sure you were really going to be a stand-up? Or were there moments like that where you just kind of questioned what you were doing? Um, those questions came later. When I already had those, uh, those great moments, it came later. I had, like, oh. I think like any artist, we, had, we go through something where we're like, man, am I doing the right thing? Mm. Should I stop? Should I, you know, it came later. Right. Oh, really? But at the beginning, I just dove into it and everything was working out. Mm. You know and I mean, and I was really lucky. And even when things were not working out, I always I always found a found a way to make it work. So basically, for example, there were not a lot of comedy room in the city in French. Right. So basically, when you get booked to one, you have to wait several months to get a second booking. Mm. That's what made me start doing comedy in English. Oh, Even okay. though my English was 
not good at all. I still don't think it's good. But, oh, it's but great. Good enough to make you laugh. Oh, so, yeah, you know absolutely. I mean? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Good enough to make you laugh. But um, so that's how I started. So I, I said, you know what? I, I, if I want more stage time, I'm going to play in both languages. So then I was doing all the rooms in English. Mm. All the comedy clubs, traveling to uh, Ottawa, mm -hmm. Toronto, sometimes New York, and just try to make mm. it happen and, you know, earn so my... So uh, how, how many years up leading up to the Tintin had you been doing stand-up comedy? Was it like uh, about three years? It was years? about three years. Three years, okay. About three years, and then yeah. you wrote your one-man show... Uh, yeah. Your first one-man show, Eddie King. Uh, yeah. Was yeah, that yeah. also quite seamless? Like you basically did it. No, it wasn't it seamless. And... It was really hard. Oh, it, it was. It was a really hard process. Like I was, man, it's another level, and I feel like after three years of doing comedy, it's a, uh, it's a lot to have on your shoulder when they put a lot of money on you, and uh, a lot of money on your promotion, on uh, promoting you, and you have you don't have much experience in the business. It's a, it's a, it was a hard process, a lot to take in, you know what oh, I mean? Okay. So basically, what I always tell to younger comics, I'm, I'm, just, I'm telling them, look, there's a price to pay. You know, you have to pay your dues to make it, right? You do. So now, you, now it's your choice. You could make it, you could pay it, like, right up front, one big, like, big payment, or you mm. can make, like, like, small payments, throughout the years mm. and make sure that you get where you're going. You know what I mean? Mm. But if you try to make it overnight, it's possible. But what's going to come your way is a lot to deal with. Oh, yeah. The, well, you got uh, thrown into a, yeah, a big exact, industry. Exactly. So can, can you get specific on, can you remember some tough times oh, well, de leading up to that? Dealing with contracts, uh, dealing with the fact that, you know, you have to be aware of the money that is spent on you. Because basically... The, the the company is there to make profits, right? And they're gonna make they're gonna try to make everything in their power to make a profit, you know what I mean? And to sell the product that they're trying to sell, which is you, right? But you have a vision. And if you're not solid in your vision, they're gonna redirect their vision. It's not because they they try to do something wrong. It's just mm -hmm. that's how it is, you know what I mean? So if you're not mature enough as an artist to know your vision. And know that, okay, this is not for me, and be firm about it. And this is where I'm going, and be firm about it. And when I say firm, don't be, like, difficult to work with. Just be firm. And knowing mm. also those, those, uh, those skills of how to make people understand your vision, articulate your vision. Mm. And I mean, all those skills, mm. you need to earn them throughout the years. But if you're blowing up overnight, then you need to learn those skills, like, very quickly. Like so within what, a year. what happened for even like your opening uh, when you did your first show well, with the public? Is, and what happened? I, it was a good reception from the public, but the way the tour was going, I was going to places that I know my 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 crowd is not in those places, and you know I mean, so sometimes I would go in places that I like, yeah, like the the show was packed, but then when you because they're like oh yeah I saw this bit from him, and then you get on the show and they're laughing, but they didn't expect to see what they're seeing. Like, oh shit, okay, oh, that's Well, because weren't seeing. you in like Lac Saint-Jean and yeah, like all went, over I Quebec? Yeah, I The only place yeah. I didn't go in Quebec is uh, Gaspésie. Oh, wow. That's the only place I didn't go. You know what really? I mean? Really? But yeah, so basically, you know, you have to understand that, yo, like, like, uh, when you sometimes I go to places where like as soon as I get in that city like the the black population goes goes up on of one hundred percent. Oh yeah, <laughs> I mean, yeah. Some people have never even yeah, seen. Yeah, so this basically. Of color. Yeah. yeah oh, so I basically, bet. not that they've never seen, but just like this is none, right? I mean, mm. so basically, when I talk about a couple of things of how I grew up and stuff, it's not the same mm. way I'm gonna talk to you, knowing that you. You know, you have a Haitian background, you have mm -hmm. black people in your family, blah, blah, blah. You know, you have a bunch of people uh, around you, so you know about black culture and stuff like that, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? But if I go in other places, it's different. Oh, yeah, because you know I even mean? find, for a long time, I didn't talk about my dad being from Haiti when I was in mm -hmm. Ottawa, because I didn't mm -hmm. feel people would understand yeah. it. Getting to Montreal, suddenly they do. But I realize as you tour across Quebec, you are suddenly entering... Uh, versions of Ottawa where yeah. people are just, you know, what they see is exactly. themselves, which is often white exactly. and don't have never met someone who would be from Haiti or from anywhere in Africa. So or, basically then 
during the show, I had to adapt the show for these kind of, for those people. Mm. So, so it's all those things that I've learned on the spot. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Things that I felt, I feel like maybe if I, if I would have taken a little bit more time to grow as an artist, mm. I would understand more. And it's so not only on the on the artistic level, but also on the business level that I'm talking about. Oh yeah, you know well, because I mean? it, it is such a business. Yeah, in, it is. Uh, it Quebec. is. You like, know? And, and that when you have producers, backers, yeah. and so I know you did a second show. Have you done two shows or three shows? Oh, it's very complicated. Because uh, I saw Mokonzi. He did Mokonzi yeah, in did 2018, Mokonzi. right? It wasn't a big tour, but I okay. did Mokon Mokonzi. Okay. And then uh, before Mokonzi, I, I did a show, but it was a taping for that is on Crave. Oh. It's called uh, Edi, c'est quand ton prochain show. Oh. Yeah, and uh, then it was an hour of material that I taped uh, at okay. the Casino de Montréal. And what inspired that? I just, I just had a whole bunch of material, and I know that Mokonzi was coming up, and I said, you know what? They proposed me, hey, you want to do a taping? Mm. We have a budget for a taping. Uh, do you want to do, do, do you want to do it? I said, yeah, why not? Then I, we taped it, and it was a success. So. Oh, cool. And yeah. when you look at, like, Mokonzi, is it Mokonzi? Mokonzi, Mokonzi. Yeah. Uh, King. Yeah. Yeah. That's what it means. Uh, yeah. In, uh, That's in cool. my language, uh, Lingala. So what, like Eddie, who did his first Eddie Preach show, yeah. compared to who you were in 2018 making Eddie. your new show, what did you learn? Eddie King. You said what Eddie, did I just say? You said Eddie Preach. <laughs> Eddie. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Where did that come I from? Think, How did Preach get even, in even here? My mom mistake me for Preach. So oh, it's okay. You're kidding. <laughs> How did Preach? Mom does it. Preach, get, get the hell out of this podcast. Uh, no, and sometimes I feel like my mom loves me more than she does love me. So, Eddie you know, Preach. <laughs> so, Eddie um, King. Yeah, yeah. How, how had. What was the big change? You said you did learn some things about like the business side of it and the creative side. What would you say some of the main things that you did shift for yourself as far as how you approached that show? Well, trust yourself. And when you have doubt, ask questions. Mm -hmm. And if people are bothered by because you're asking questions, especially when it comes to contracts, then it's maybe it's not the people you want to work with. Because if you want me to sign a contract and I'm asking a bunch of questions about it, and you're like, but why are you asking me all these questions? Just sign the damn, the damn paper. I'm like, well, no, I'm not going to do it. You know. And sometimes in this business, some people will try to pressure you for on signing some documents that sometimes you don't, you're not sure what it, it, what it really involves, you know what I mean? So that's show business mm. and any type of show business, any type of uh, like comedy, music, any, it's, it's always like that. So people mm. will pressure you. If you take the time to read a contract and sometimes it's not even the big executive, sometimes it's just like maybe an assistant, his job is like, yo, make sure he signs that contract. You're like, okay, you get the contract and you're like, well, I'm not understand what I'm reading right now. Oh, but it's okay. Don't worry about it. Uh, just sign it. It's nothing. It means this and this and that. Is well, it's not clear to me. So, sorry, I can't sign it right now. I need to take some time to. And some some people get frustrated, especially if mm -hmm. you're like the assistant and the, you just need to get this signed, or else, you, or else you're gonna get in trouble. I'm like, well, I'm sorry. Well, make it more clear. Oh, you have the confidence to do that too. Like I but, find sometimes with contracts, I'm a people pleaser, so I would never want to say like, oh, I don't, I don't know if this is gonna work or you I know, know i don't want to say no but, but i realize thing. it's so important you signed your your yeah. life away sometimes and that's where you need to have more experience mm. where like as a you need to people need to like young comics need to earn more experience and finding their selves and knowing their stuff enough to kind of gauge how to respond to those kind of situations because mm. if you're not comfortable with something you know you have to address it but like you your discomfort you're not going to express your discomfort the same way i will Mm. You know what I mean? So sometimes if I express it in a certain way, if you try the same thing, maybe it's not gonna go it's gonna it's not gonna fly. Mm. But if I try to for example, if I, if you you would be like more soft and more like, hey, you know what, you know, try to maybe your skills is like, you know, knowing how to find the right words to, you know, I avoid the whole thing. Mm. Maybe if I try that then it's not gonna work with me. So maybe I have to be mm. more firm a certain time or one of the things that I do I'm firm, but I'm joke, but I'm still making jokes, and to make sure, yo, look, I'm firm. I'm very firm about what I said. I'm not gonna sign this, but I'm still your friend. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's nothing against you. Yeah. So it's those things that you have to feel like you have to develop, and you know, you have to know yourself, and you have to, yeah. So that's why I'm saying that you have to pay your dues to learn all those skills 
but if he goes fast, you're gonna have to learn these skills mm. like on the spot, quick. Well, well, and did you have challenges with, or do you have challenges ever with self confidence or believing in yourself? Because you appear to be someone who has no problem with confidence and would never be in doubt of yourself. It depends what we're talking about. Well, I'm not talking about personal. I'm talking about career, but career wise, let's get into well, personal. It, it, I want to hear depends. about it. <laughs> even, no, in, even in my career, it depends what I'm talking about. <laughs> One thing I'm confident about, I'm funny. Mm. And I know how to make people laugh. So and have you always been confident with that? Would you say from the get-go, right when you started stand-up yeah, comedy, you had no doubts? Yeah, because I know the work I put in. Right. So because I know the work I put in, I know, I know that I've done all the work, then... You coming at me saying, "Yo, Eddie's not funny. He's not, his jokes are not funny." I'm like, "No." Nah, but what about when you when you've uh, bombed? Have you had any major bombs where you've got like never, a crowd of ne 500 never, people? And never. But when I bomb, which still happens, it's never like, "Yo, it's the it's the crowd. It's 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 not me. It's them." It's never like that. If I bomb, I know that is because I haven't done the right thing or the right work at the right moment. But never, it will, I will never doubt the fact that I'm a funny person. Mm. Because one time bobbing does not wipe out all the great shows that I've done, all the great set that, I, that, that I've mm. had. You know what I mean? But of course, if I bomb, which it still happens, and even bombing is part of my writing process, to be quite honest. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, it is. <laughs> it is. I even think, I feel like, I think I didn't believe 100% I was funny until about five years into stand-up comedy. Oh, yeah? Because for me, because I would always have this risk of bombing. And if I bombed, as you know, with stand-up, if people didn't like your show, they didn't like you. So you leave, at least that would be for me, I would feel like a total loser and be like, I'm not funny. Then I would go on stage to try to be funny again. Mm. But I think I had more self-confidence issues than maybe you have had in, in, in your career. Yeah. But again, as you said, it depends on what you're talking about. If you're confident... Because we all, some of us are, I think with stand-up, it was a struggle to find confidence and to kind of like really believe in what I'm doing. I think my confidence comes from my background with rap music because rap music is, you have to be confident to rap and especially when it comes to battling and stuff like that, you really have to... to it's like to a chicken a certain, fight to, in a way. To, to a certain, yeah, to a certain mm. degree, it's a sport. It's mm. even a sport, so you have to come very confident so i think those things followed me through comedy but i'm confident but not cocky so basically i'm not gonna walk around like oh i'm the funniest on oh, and i never say that and you know me i'm not that's not the way i am mm. but when i say i'm co being confident is that you tell me yo eddie you're not funny i'm like yes i am and that's it yeah end of the conversation mm. i don't need to prove it to you I, i'm just yes i am i know i'm funny even if you say, nah, it's not funny, I don't like him, I am funny. Mm. Maybe you don't like what I do, but I am funny. Mm. You know what I mean? I know how to make people laugh because I really work hard to know how to make people laugh. You know what I mean? So you have to have that confidence. Mm. And also, this is also a skill. And make sure you're not turning this confidence into cockiness. Because mm. if you do, that's where you... Cocky people usually lack confidence at some degree. Oh, yeah. And you I've noticed I mean? that with people when they yeah. become famous. Yeah. Comedians, a lot of them become exactly. shitty, cocky people. <laughs> 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 um, so let, let's delve a little bit into uh, your childhood in the sense of I know you moved here when you were 13 years old yeah. from yeah. Paris. And exactly. So when you look back, because here it is, you're a comedian, you're a professional comedian. This is what you do for a living. Uh -huh. When you look back at yourself before 13, when you were like 12, 11, even as a little kid, mm. what were you consuming as a kid as far as like comedy and what maybe influenced you? And oh. sometimes people weren't influenced in their childhoods, but like, were you someone who consumed a lot of comedy as a kid? I was influenced, but not by, not, not for, to perform, but I was like the, the some of my favorite com uh, comedians, it was a, th uh, th uh, a trio uh, of com comedians called uh, Les, Les Inconnus back mm. in France. Oh, These, Les Inconnus, yeah. You know them, yeah, right? it's a TV show, isn't it? Uh, but they had Les a whole it? bunch of TV specials oh, with a whole okay. bunch of sketches. The, these guys, like, they made me laugh like crazy, you know what I mean? And who did uh, you watch all that with? Was it with siblings or with your yeah, mom? Yeah, my or? cousin, like, yeah. and when there was a, a special, uh, a Les Inconnus special on TV, uh, 
uh, man, like the next day, you better have watched it because like we all gonna talk about it at school. Mm. You know what I mean? So yeah, they were pretty funny. They were funny to adults. They were funny to kids. They, so yeah. was it a little bit like a Saturday Night Live kind of? Uh, Did you ever watch Saturday Night Live? Yeah, 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 yeah. But not, not, like not sketches really. and stuff like no, that. No, it was more like uh, you know RBO here, Elle Elle Roque Belle Oh, is, okay. Yeah, yeah, like it was more like that, but in French. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's more that more of that format. So you would go to school like with your friends. Were you a, f a funny guy, like cracking your friends up and? Not necessarily. Not necessarily. Mm -hmm. I'm not that kind of funny person. Like I'm not the person that will walk in the room and make everyone laugh. Mm. I'm not that person. I'm like, you know, if I don't tell you I'm a comedian, you will never know I'm a comedian. <laughs> you will never know. See, I was that irritating person at house parties. I always said oh, I got yeah? kicked <laughs> off the house party circuit because people would be like, just can you shut up for like 10 <laughs> minutes? Because I wouldn't stop. But now I find I've become less funny in life. Uh. But it's irritating, as you know, when people are like, are you, how can you be a comedian? Because you're not funny, but you're not someone who's on exactly. all the time. Like, I'm at a comedy club. You would think I'm the bouncer yeah. before thinking <laughs> I'm the comedian until I get on stage. And mm. that's the thing. That's why I'm so confident about my comedy is because I know I'm not that naturally funny kind of guy. Mm. But I'm very, um, I'm very, um, I'm very, uh, come on, just a. I really work hard to know how to make people laugh and make sure my jokes work. Mm. Like I really the study craft. the craft. Mm. You know what I mean? And that's why that's why I'm so confident because I know I've done my homework. You know, mm. like just kind of like a you have an exam at school, you studied left and right, mm. up and down all night. You know every, all the information is in your head. And you know, hey man, I'm gonna I'm gonna get a hundred percent on this exam. Mm. I know it. So what you know is what your I mean? what is your study process? Uh, watching a lot of comedy, mm. watching a lot, a lot of comedy, watching like older comedians, younger comedians, uh, always be open to learn from even, especially from younger comics, always be open to learn because mm. it's moving so fast. People are kind of like rapping, you know, you know, rapping like this, that old school 80s flow, like beep, boop, da, ba, boop, do, da, da. And mm. then, then, then you have the Jay-Zs and then you have all the mumble rappings. And so it evolves, right? Mm. And you have to understand how things are evolving. And it's the same thing with comedy. Would you know what, what type of topics, what topics have been done and redone? Uh, uh, what type of like uh, punching techniques people are using? Mm. What type of punching techniques people are overusing? You know what I mean? Mm. For example, you know, we know that in comedy, uh, I think people are overusing the the rule of three. You know what I mean? Saying thumps, mm. say, saying three, two things that make sense, and the third one is the is a punchline. You know what I mean? They all, it's, so it's been overused. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So those things you have to look up and see also how young comics are approaching comedy, how they 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 doing it, how they the the the, the innovate. In comedy and so, are you someone who like? Do you use a notebook? Do you like when you get an idea? What's the whole process of, um, like even for your Russia joke that you were doing, yeah, um, and that you did for the gala? I saw it at Le Baldel. What was the process to get to the gala where you feel like the material is ready to go? Like, do you have kind of a, a typical routine for yourself of how it starts? So basically, mm -hmm. I choose a subject, right? Because that's like I said earlier, the subject like comes in. You know, I, I have a certain, like, I feel something about, so, you know, it, it, I'm, I'm either hurt or, uh, but I feel some type of way about this, about the, what's happening on the subject. And then I sit down. Uh, it depends. Sometimes it's on my book and sometimes it's in, on my computer, but I sit down and I start writing a whole bunch of premises about the subject, right? Just not trying to be funny, just try to be as true as I can be and as, uh, and try to state facts about the subject. You know what I mean, and um, and and express how I feel about those facts about the subject. And later on, I go back and try to put punchlines on it. Mm. And you know, so sometimes I go up on stage with a few premises, half of a punch, go on stage, bomb, and mm. then and but you I, tape but, it right. But I, I tape, tape it, and then sets. I go back yeah. home and I listen to it in my car. And that painful, that painful. <laughs> Uh, listen, listening session goes into like, fuck, I should have said that. Fuck, yeah. I should have said this. Mm. Man, it, maybe if I would have said that, you know, then it, it would work. Nah, nah, nah. And then I take notes of that. And then that's how I start building my set. 
basically I go, I express uh, expressly, uh, exp expressément, comment dire? Mm. Um, oh, you. I purposely, sorry. Mm. I purposely bomb. Oh, almost you do? purposely bomb. Really? Yeah. And then from there, listen to myself like I'm someone else. Like I'm criticizing another comic. Mm. I'm like, yeah, you should. I. But go back a bit. How do you purposefully bomb? In it's just because I know almost... that I'm not going on stage yes. with a full on finish mm. bit or finish joke. You know what mm. I mean? So it's always like weird, awkward, and there's silence, and you know, and sometimes, and I'm like, wow, okay. Yeah. And then I go back home and I'm like, okay, maybe I should have said that. Mm. Like I'm listening to myself like I'm someone else. I'm oh, man. Yo, Eddie, you should have said that instead. Mm. Oh, shit, good good point. Then I'm going to do that. Oh, man, instead of saying this, you know, you know, reverse those words. Maybe it's going to work better. Oh, sh good point, Eddie. So I'm talking to myself like mm. that. And that's where the the the, the old bit uh, comes to life and then it oh. come, becomes perfect. But you, when you when I say I bomb, I don't bomb everywhere, of course. I'm not going to do that uh, by, uh, at Place des Arts, yeah. <laughs> which is yeah. the worst way, the worst thing. But... Uh, I'll, I'll do it at open mics and places where you, you uh, that are that are you know, rooms that are created for people to try new things. Well, that's I mean? something that I think a lot of English comedians don't know about because in Quebec I love that that there's these rodage rooms, which is workout yeah. rooms where you get yeah. paid sixty to one hundred and fifty dollars, and the audience coming expects new jokes and expects material that isn't fully polished. Yeah. We don't really have that in... But we uh, do. We do. I, I find it yuck yucks and uh, absolute this, this, comedy. This when I'm working weekends, they don't want you doing new material. But uh, but 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 that, those are open, but, but they have open mics, mic nights, right? Uh, but the open mic night, especially I find it absolute comedy, it is a showcase because if you're doing the open mic, you want to work the weekends. And if the club owner's there, it's almost a showcase. So I just don't find... Having done 10 years of uh, open mic stuff in Toronto, first of all, I don't find there's pay. There's not a lot of pay for open mics uh, compared to here. You can make almost like 600 bucks a week but that's in not, French. But here's, but here's the thing. If, you, if you're referring to the bordel, those are not open mics. No, not open mics, but there are en rodage rooms, yeah, I find. Yeah, but the, where en, en rodage is when you have... A, a set that you're sure about and you just need to tweak a few things here and there. Yes. So oh. then the, that's a different level, but I'm never going to bomb or do uh, like, uh, I'm not, I'm never going to break any material on those kind of comedy night. Or yes, if I do, you're going to go maybe, more maybe to Maybe I'll try with one joke and if right. it doesn't work, I'm going to move on with my safe material. You yes. know what I mean? But when, is, when I talk about like more like open mic or like smaller comedy rooms mm -hmm. where you have open micers going like new beginners and stuff like mm -hmm. that, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. You know that if you go to these kind of comedy night, like the newcomers are not necessarily going to be, have the most polished, they're not going to have the most polished material. They're not going to be, um, you know, they're not going to have much experience. Like if you're first time on stage, chances are that you might bomb, you know what yeah. I mean? So yeah. in those kind of comedy night, I give myself a chance to try new material mm. and, like I said, purposely bomb, mm. you know what I mean? And then build from there. Yeah, well, I've seen you, and, and open mic at Le Baldel, right? Yeah, that, yeah, yeah, That's always a really good yeah. spot. And what, I remember hearing that someone at Le Baldel had left or there was a fist fight kind of over the Russia joke. Was that I don't something know about that... a fist fight, but it was a. I know that someone was really mad, was really mad uh, because basically in my bit, it's because the the, the 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 bit the my set was about Ukraine and Ukraine war, right? So basically, how it started is because um, my daughter, nine years old, asked me about the war in Ukraine to explain it to her because I think. Her, her teacher is half Ukrainian, so she had a lot of questions about that because I think they spoke about it a lot when uh, when they were in class. So she asked me, she's like, oh, Daddy, what's going on in Ukraine? And when you try to explain this to a nine years old, mm. says a whole bunch of... So, so basically, the bit starts by saying, you know, have you ever had your, 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 your kids asking you a question that you're not qualified to answer to? And I mean, so my, my daughter asked me to uh, tell about the war in Ukraine, but she, she asked me because... She doesn't know that her dad is a dumbass. She doesn't know that, right? <laughs> She's not aware of it. So, but I try to answer the, like the best that I could. Mm -hmm. But I feel like uh, I think 
my answer was so bad that I think that because of me, my daughter's taking for the wrong, for the wrong side right now. <laughs> 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 you know what I mean? So that's okay. how the bit starts. So yes. basically, the first answer I give my daughter is like, okay, so you're nine years old, so I'm trying to keep it simple. Ukraine used to be part of Russia, but uh, Putin is mad and he wants it back. Mm. And I mean, keep mm. it simple like that. Mm. And to which my daughter answers me, but dad, if it was his, let's give it back to him. I'm like, oh, no, no, whoa, 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 no, it's not how it works, you know. Mm-hmm. So the, how the, that's that's what that's how the joke goes, right? Yes. And uh, so the but guy, but in its the, tricky the, territory, exactly. Of yes, but it's the, sticky. The guy in front of me, because I said Ukraine was part, uh, Ukraine was 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 uh, was part of Russia. He didn't take it well. Because oh, it's not okay. part of Russia. Yes. It was it yes. was part of the how do you call it in English en français c'est URSS the CCCP PPPCC uh, okay. the U, the Soviet the Soviet Union USSR USSR okay. okay so it was part of the the U, the the Soviet Union right so it, and um, but I just simplified it to my daughter because if I said yo uh, Soviet Union and stuff like yes, that yes it was it's not in the understand. moment I was just like yo Ukraine was part of Russia and mm. now they're mad <laughs> you know you know what I mean well, but with, he, but, but, but I think the guy was maybe Ukraine or maybe from a another country in Eastern Europe and when he heard that but he was really drunk though oh okay so he was he got mad and is like it's not even true Ukraine was never part of Russia I was like yeah I know. But now you try to explain that to eight years old. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> you know exactly. I mean? Well, I think we've all, in stand-up, a lot of us have done, you know, you don't even think about a word that you're saying, but then once you've said it, like uh, the R word, I did something where, you know, people don't want you to say retarded anymore. Mm. And I did a, I, I showed up late for a gig yeah. and didn't get the memo that we weren't supposed to use that word because it was a, mm. they had changed the yeah, word within yeah, this, yeah. this organization. And I yeah. said it twice. I was uh. like, my kids are retarded uh. and got in major shit for it. Uh. But it, I, I, I'm, I'm more, I became more aware of like just words that I would not but even you, you think have, about, you, you know, stand up is so much about yeah. efficacy of language. Your words are your weapon. So you mm. have to be aware of how you manipulate your weapons. You know what I mean? But in that case, I was actually, the old joke was me, was about me saying the wrong, try to simplify the thing and saying the wrong thing. So the, as I was going and trying to explain to, to my daughter, it was getting worse. Mm. But he didn't even let me go through that. So basically, oh, right. when, yes. I, say, when yeah. I say it was, part, uh, it was part of Russia and Putin is mad, he wants it back. And she answered, yo, but dad, if it was his, let's give it back to him. And I'm like, mm-hmm. oh, whoa, 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 no, 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 no. Yeah. So then I tried, uh, then I correcting myself right after. I'm saying, right. no, no, and no. And you didn't even get Ru- to that part. Ukraine is, a, is his own country, own language and everything. It's just that after the World War II, there was a division in the world, East versus West, the Cold War, capitalism versus communism. Mm. And then my daughter asked, like, but what's capitalism, what's communism? Then I'm like, oh, okay, great. shit. Then I have to explain <laughs> that. So that's the whole bit, me going, yeah. d- like, like, you know, deeper and deeper, digging mm. myself deeper and deeper and deeper. Mm. But he didn't let me go through the whole thing. So that's why he got mad. But that's the only time I had someone. Yeah. But, you know, sometimes people just don't, I feel like someone someone told me that one time. Uh, uh, it's, it was Michel Grenier, the, the uh, Mike Was manager. He mm. told me like the same way that you have a IQ, you also have a comedic IQ, and mm. some people don't have the same comedic IQ. Oh yeah. Some people don't understand the jokes or the level of jokes the same way as other people. Some people need like they just have they just want basic jokes. Well, often mm-hmm. people have said, too, like, y- if you say, for instance, the word cancer, even if it's a joke yeah. that is not against cancer or it's yeah. not offensive to anyone, yeah. if they just hear cancer, people are offended. The it, same, it's, same it's, with, it's with very, the word rape. The, oh, there, there's... Sometimes the N-word. Sometimes oh, yeah. a whole bunch of words that are really triggering. And yet even you if have you, to work around Even it. if you're really careful and you kind of position yeah. it and you and you, you explain it very carefully, you're still going to get people... Yeah. And, and also, I think, by nature, your comedy, you know, you, you do toe the line because you're... Mm. With the subjects that you're choosing to talk about, which mm. are subjects that people are afraid 
to kind of embark on, which I think yeah. is a great thing because you're kind of known as that. Well, Eddie will take care of talking <laughs> about that because no one else will talk about it. Well, and I it was guess. cool to see your jokes evolve into the Just Pour Rire Gala, right? Thank and you. you. So that was a matter of, I know you go up a lot, like you'll do like three or four shows a night and you kind of just keep working on it, yeah. slimming, you know, trimming the fat and yeah. keep going. Is that really what the process was for that? Yeah, uh, yeah For your eight minute set? Spe especially, because when the the war in Ukraine uh, broke out, uh, I was still in the in the in the in the Big Brother's house. Oh, okay. All right, so I I got out, and I think the, the war happened like it was already a, a month in, you know what I mean? So uh, so I felt some type of way, but even more, what really came to bother me is when I saw like the footage of people getting uh, the evacuation, and they were keeping black people and oh, yeah. uh, immigrants to be evacuated like the others. And I saw like even in the worst, one of the worst uh, time, uh, time of war like that, they still find the time to have some racism. When you know, because we that close to World War Three, right? Mm -hmm. And World War Two, the background of World War Two or the the foreground of World War Two, you know, basically it was racism. It was um, uh, how's called that in um, Holocaust and uh, mm. uh, you know all these things. So have what have we learned from that? You know what I mean, what have we learned from those things? Well, I thought the way you know articulated mean? it was, was was really powerful. Thanks, thanks. So then I had to find a way to talk about it, and also because. Uh, I did twice. I did shows for NATO's, the NATO. I noticed that. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah amazing. One time in 2015 in uh, Poland, and one, and one time in 2019 amazing. in uh, Lviv. Yeah, I saw you with pictures of like yeah, testing out the guns exactly, and stuff. I was exactly. like, that's trippy. And I know all those troops were there wow. for that in case it goes yeah. down in in uh, mm. in, uh, in 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 Ukraine. Yeah, uh, so you have a different on. context. Yeah, for yeah. It. So I kind of knew the whole thing. So then. It went down, and mm. I was like, okay, so there's a whole bunch of things I didn't understand that I felt like I, I saw some people, you know, and when I go, when they, they send people like us, like comedians, to entertain the troops, is because and we know that the troops out there are like, they mentally, they need some entertainment because they, they stationed there for those kind of things. Mm -hmm. So I don't understand why, because I remember one time, uh, the first time I went to Poland, uh, the, it, it was a show for Canadian Army, that were training with the Pol Polish army and stuff like that. So I went there and they were very, um, they had a bad time because they extended their stay for like six months and mm -hmm. it was during Christmas time. So they yeah. sent me last minute. And just the fact that I got there, those soldiers, they were like just happy, like, oh man, you know, at least, you know, because. You were kind of a band-aid for yeah, them in a way so, to cheer them up. And it's so weird because for these soldiers, what they told me is like, 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 if I have to stay here and not see my family, why do I have to do it for a training where I could do, like, at least if it was like a war going on, mm. then I know I'm doing something, and like, there's a purpose for that. But now, mm -hmm. we're just training, and, yeah. I'm, and I'm, not, I'm not away from my family. Like, mm. they're extending it for, for six months, so that's where I came and did the show and, you know, cheered them up and stuff like that. That's so cool. I knew kind of what's going on, and then the war breaks out, and then NATO's not doing much. Mm. You know what I mean? And yeah. I know it's very tricky and complicated. But I was just thinking about those soldiers that I saw when I was there mm -hmm. and having a hard time being there and staying and extending their stay and not seeing their family, you know? Mm -hmm. So that that's what I was thinking about also. Mm -hmm. you know? um, I'm gonna switch gears completely uh -huh. um, because right now we're at the just pour rire transition mm -hmm. from French into English. Yeah. And I think a lot of people would be like, oh, well, you must have a whole bunch of English shows booked because you're a rock star <laughs> in French comedy. So what is your story with English and French? And, you know, you're doing exclusively French. Is there any sort of, do you wish you were doing some shows in the English side of things too? And why, you know, can you explain? I, I wish I, I wish I was, but I know I wasn't ready right now because, you know, preparing galas was a lot of work. And I know I was not going to have enough time especially because I was in the big brother's house mm -hmm. for eight, for, for two months. I was not going to have enough time to be pre to prepared. I was not, I wasn't even there for the, for the audition part. No, I was there for the audition, but I wasn't okay. ready. And you, you know, 
So, yeah, I kind of, I wish I could be part of it. Because you I'm have be done both it. at yeah, times, yeah, I've done, right? I've You've done, done, uh, I've done English I've, and French. Yeah, I've done I've done a taping. Last year, I also did the, the taping for the Just for Life Originals. Oh, yeah, yeah. I did yeah. the Kevin okay. Hart LOL a few, years ago, a few years ago. So I've done things in English. Yeah. But it's just that right now I wasn't ready, and my all my focus was on the gala that I had to prepare. Mm. You know what I mean? So, but I'm still enjoying the... The show, and I know, uh, and I know, like uh, that the festival, either just for life or just boy, they have uh, a lot of respect for my work, and I'm really grateful about that. It's a great relationship. I That's never great. been with anyone as far as production and management. I never been with anyone than just boy. I know. I, in management, I was with someone else, but like I always been. Oh with yeah, your your manager is François, and he's with just boy. Yeah, Poirier. yeah, exactly. Yes. But since 2009, as far as like production or management. I've been chez Juste Pour Rire since 2009, and I never left. You know what I mean? So well, I, I still have a great relationship. So that's why it doesn't really bother me to, to not have well, uh, do you Do you think on the English side we have a pretty healthy industry? Like, you know, it's a... Well, on the English side, in Montreal, uh, uh, there, was a, there was a lot of veterans left the city almost at the same time. Uh, mm. Diane Smith, uh, Jessica Jess Solomon, Solomon yeah. Iman, Ali Hassan, mm -hmm. uh, Daniel Tirado, uh, a whole bunch of people left. A whole bunch of people left. And he kind of let like an empty mm -hmm. spot. We lost the comedy works also. The, the, the comedy, like, like the, comedy, the, the comedy club burned down. So I think English comedy in Montreal took a hit at some point. But now with C Sid Kular. Mm -hmm. He done a tremendous work to kind of like revamp like the whole industry, the whole English industry of comedy, and mm. and honestly, it makes a difference. And yeah, I think uh, uh, the English side of comedy in Montreal right now is healthier than ever. Oh really? Uh, okay. Uh, there's a lot, a lot of places that you could, a lot of rooms that you could play at. There's the Comedy Nest. There's a you could play like two, three times a night in English. Mm. So it's so great. I think I'm a little, <laughs> I'm a bit more negative about the English scene, having just done 10 shows in French in the festival, and then to look at the English side of things, I do wish that there were more opportunities for Canadian comedians who, who live here in Canada. That, live in Canada in general? Yeah, in, yeah, yeah, because I think a lot of people doing the festival are all from, you know, people who live in New York and live in L.A., and that's just, that's kind of the just the reality. I was talking to someone about that last night, that... There's a big contrast, like for me, doing my first French Just Pour Rire Gala and sitting in an audience where it's all yeah. people from Canada listening yeah. to people, Canadian, talking. Yeah. And, and that all of these comedians have been developed, that there's like kind of a system of development for ca mm. Canadian talent to improve. I think that we could do a better job with our Canadian talent so that they don't have to leave and go to the United States and become famous and come back. And uh, that's, that's just, that's my opinion. I just think, I, like I know... I know all the comedians that are on the roster this year, mm. and there's only like three uh, who are actually still living in Canada. Paul being one of the guys we know who lives in yeah, Winnipeg, yeah. but you know a lot of the other comedians do live in LA and 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 in New York. And there's nothing wrong with that. I just think I don't think you should have to leave your own country to to get kind of notice. Like Steph Tolev, look what she's doing. She's destroying, uh, destroying. in LA, yeah, and she yeah, couldn't yeah, get yeah. booked in clubs here. Yak Yaks yeah, and yeah. Absolute Comedy both yeah. said she was too dirty. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. she had to leave to but, to kind of almost find her fame, which but, I think is unfortunate. Here's the, here's the thing. Uh, I I understand it. I get it. And I I used to be very frustrated about that too. I. Less frustrated, I have less frustration because there's also something that I understand is the it's a numbers game. We're not that many in Canada, so no matter what you do, it could be music, it could be it could be uh, comedy, it could be anything. Sometimes, if you want to attract a larger audience, audience, we're not that many. We're like what 36 millions in the whole Canada. You know what I mean? So mm -hmm. it's uh, it's a bit hard to. To well, basically, and also when I know what you're going to say is that Americans bring bring watchers. People want to see the Americans. They uh, want to see the Chelsea Handlers, no, well, the he, Bill Burr. No, the, it's not even yeah. what I'm talking about. Oh, okay. see, uh, that's when you have want to have your own audience, mm -hmm. and you, and if you're more niched and stuff like that, you know. 
But the other part is also that when you come to the festival and you have all these people coming from around the world, like especially new faces, you have to compete with the rest of the world. The rest of the world. So you to be able to compete with the rest of the world, you have to be where the rest of the world is or travel the rest of the world. Mm. So you know that your comedy works everywhere. You, you got to earn that experience. Mm. You know what I mean? So, yeah, you. it's not that... Canadian comedy or Montreal comedy is not good. It's very good. And and I'm actually very proud because I feel like now, more than ever since I started, I've never seen that many people from Montreal in the festival at the same time. Oh, and yeah, the English yeah, yeah, side? Yeah. On the English side, like yeah. Like who? Like who? Wasim, uh, Raji, uh, Rashid. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah, Ra- oh, Rashid's Rashid. doing a gala. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. There's uh, who else uh, I was thinking about? Um, uh... Man, I forgot. Yeah, because I know. Well, I know the comedians. There's Catherine Ryan, Russell Peters, Paul, Dave Murray. Right now, I'm really talking about only the people from Montreal. Oh, from Montreal. Yes. There haven't been that many. Are are Jesse and um, her partner back again this year or no? I I haven't seen them. Okay, Jess Solomon and. uh, And, uh, but I'm saying really people from Montreal, but like living in Montreal. There's 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 more than I never I ever seen before. Oh, really? Yeah, but now if you count the people that are outside. There's even more, and now if you count like the old Canadian, there's even mm. more. And le- well, like, and it's I, always it's always a touchy subject, you I know? know. Like I, I start know. sweating, but I'm I like, know. cut, it cut is, some of that. <laughs> it is, but well, it's because you know what it is is because I think sometimes, at least I always found, and this is from working in the clubs in Ottawa, m- I find my job was always a little bit at stake. Like when I started headlining at Yuck Yucks, I was told from Absolute Comedy I couldn't work for them anymore, yeah, but even though I worked for them for seven years. So. I think that even just being in the arts, sometimes your your job can be at risk. So sometimes yeah, people are hesitant yeah. to talk about certain things because yeah. you're but like, I, but am I, I going to get fired? On, you know, on this on that side, like the yuck yucks, uh, absolute thing. I I really think it's stupid. To yeah, be honest. But I mean, uh, yeah, yeah. But I'm, I'm you know, I can say it because I'm not really. Like, well, and also if you work in them. French, it's <laughs> yeah, fanta- it's a fantastic like that, industry too. It's stupid, but you know, it is what it is. I mean, you know, they 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 the one who, who decide how they want to run their clubs yeah right? absolutely well and just in closing because mm. we do have to wrap it up a bit yeah. um i w- i'm curious because i know you're a dad yeah. and you're a comedian yeah. and and that is a juggle how do you manage the juggle of like having kids uh, and having uh, a usually, career that's exploding usually it's, i manage but this year is a hard year mm. being away from my kids for two months and coming back and have to prepare prepare this gala yeah i haven't seen uh, much of my kids uh in the oh because with months. big brother you were yeah, away for two months yeah i was away for oh, two wow, months that's but huge. like but two months no access to them cannot even not be able to talk to them they, they can only see me on tv you know what i mean which is really hard but um other than that usually I re- i'm able to manage yeah it's interesting because big brother was like a, a a clear sacrifice where you're saying like <sighs> i am because sometimes you just make mild sacrifices uh-huh. for your career or for your family. But yeah. I hadn't realized that. Yes, you're saying, I'm not going to talk to my kids for not, two months for the yeah. sacrifice of celebrity, which is what you did get. I mean, you it's, know, not, it's not the yeah. sacrifice of celebrity because I, I, you know, I was already known before doing Big Brother. But mm. it's really a sacrifice of trying to get to another level, but also a sacrifice to get out of my comfort zone. Because mm. this show is nothing like I'm, yeah. like my personality at all. You know what I mean? So just try to get out of my comfort zone. And that's only how you can win. Mm. Try to get out of the comfort zone. Try new things. Not be afraid to to bomb or to... to yeah. Mm. Yeah, that's it. Well, that's inspiring. And I, and you had a great year. Like, as you yeah. said, you it has been a bit tough with the balance. But mm. I'm sure you'll be getting that back because you won't be anywhere for two months without access again, right? Yeah. yeah no, I'm now you'll just be again. revisiting the show. Yeah. Well, thanks for coming out. Thanks for having me. It was really me. nice to chat with you about your process and merci, everything that's merci, gotten you here. Beaucoup, you know, you know, I love your work. I love you. I love all energy. So it was a, it was an honor for me oh, to Oh, thanks, be here. Eddie. <laughs> Not Eddie Preach, Eddie King, people. Yes. (laughs) Great.